Thursday weekly learning session for local bartending school. My name is Carlos Navia. Uh, I've been a professional bartender for 20 plus years now in several different states, even ran a bar in Mexico for a while, which is where I met my wife, who I usually say lives with me here in San Luis Obispo, but today I'm not coming to you from San Luis Obispo. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California, more specifically, Hollywood. You can see behind me, I'm at the Hollywood Historic Hotel here on Melrose Avenue in Hollywood in Los Angeles. And, you know, knowing I was going to be here uh, today and kind of do a little something different, I really wanted to theme today's thing, you know, about cocktails in Hollywood and how the two relate. Um, I am here at the bar at the hotel here. Um, it is an excellent bar. It's a very cool place. I really intended on coming from inside. I did not realize that they did not open till five o'clock. So they still got a couple hours. They're actually setting up now. I'll show you a little bit of their patio. As you can see, they got a nice patio out here. And this is really what California has become in the pandemic era. Uh, you know, we weren't allowed to have inside seating for a long time. So people built patios and it's great. It's awesome in the town I live in. It's like a lot of sidewalk cafes. Um, I really love how the industry has just adapted, you know, to what we have and, and what we're dealing with and what we're working with. But as I got into, you know, thinking about cocktails in Hollywood, I got on my computer and I Googled cocktails in Hollywood and I ended up going down a much deeper rabbit hole than I had originally intended on going into. Um, you know, I, I wrote down some topics and started trying to kind of fill them in to, to, to make a good lecture, to make a good something for today, since I'm not at home with my usual bar setup to do a demonstration or anything like that. And what I ended up realizing was like how much bars play into cinema. And it's one of those things, you know, cinema, movies, television, stuff like that is just a reflection of society. It reflects what's going on in that period and, you know, what's happening in the world around you. And, you know, I, I found it incredible how many bars are, you know, integral parts of movies, television shows and other stuff that, that we do for entertainment. So I just want to kind of start with today talking about just that bars and entertainment and how they play their role in, you know, that part of society. Um, starting, you know, starting off just talking about movies. Um, there, there's a very famous movie. It's probably the quintessential bartender movie out there, made in 19, released in 1988, I should say, starring Tom Cruise called Cocktail. Now, in 1988, I was 14 years old when I first saw this movie. So last night, very late into the night till about 2.30 in the morning, I stayed up and I watched Cocktail uh, while drinking, let's call them deconstructed Cuba Libres. Which, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I was doing a shot of rum, biting a lime, and washing it down with Coca-Cola, deconstructing Cuba Libre. But I was watching it, and I was, you know, I wanted to give the movie a chance. I saw it when I was 14 years old. Um, you know, that was still two years before I served my first alcoholic beverage and sold my first alcoholic beverage. So I really didn't, you know, understand a lot about the business and a lot of things, you know, that were going on. So 31 years later, or 33 years later, I should say, I sat down and I watched it again. Um, you know, I remember being 14 years old and thinking there was parts of the movie I definitely liked and parts of the movies I really didn't care for, which is most of the movie. Uh, 33 years later, I watched it again and I still like the same parts. And I didn't care for most of the movie, um, just like when I was 14 years old. It, it's, it's a very cool movie. It's a very iconic movie. Um, it is, though, more of a, you know, romantic comedy than anything else. And the love story is really the underlying part of, you know, the entire movie. Um, I do like the very beginning when Tom Cruise gets into the bar and he's just getting his butt kicked. People ask him, someone asks him for a martini and he just looks at him and says, what's in that? And, you know, it's kind of funny is that's the real way to play it. You know, none of us know what's in every cocktail. And the easiest way to find out is usually just to ask the person that ordered it. Um, I know when I was learning, I thought that, you know, if I do that, I'm going to look like I don't know what I'm doing. That's not the case. The truth is the people just want their drink. They don't really care if you know a 10,000 drinks or, you know, a million drinks. All they want is that one drink you're serving them so they can have their cocktail. So I thought that was a great part of the movie. Uh, you know, the other thing that movie really did is open up the flair bartending world. Because that was, I think, a lot of people's first experience with flipping bottles, tossing bottles, stuff like that, you know, that goes on. Um, the movie is also very tragic. 
which is one of the reasons I don't necessarily care for it. Um, you know, it's the bar scenes are okay. Uh, they're not very realistic. If you know what you're doing and, and you have a chance to look at them and kind of break them down. Um, a lot of the bottles that Tom Cruise is flipping are empty. And he's just holding bottles upside down with nothing coming out of them quite often. Um, you know, it, it's a movie. It, it's made in Hollywood. It's made here. It's for that reason. It's not supposed to be real life depiction, but it's pretty good. And it's a fun movie to watch. Um, you know, it, it's been th 33 years since I've seen it. And what's funny is I've had a lot of people come up to me in that time and tell me I've literally lived that because I bartended across the country. And at one point I packed it all up, went to the Yucatan down to the Caribbean and did end up falling in love, meeting my wife and, you know, moving back to the United States. So I guess there are some similarities in that, but, you know, there's tons of other movies that revolve around bars. Look at Coyote Ugly. Not only is that a great movie about women's empowerment, but it, you know, it launched a whole uh, chain of bars called Coyote Ugly that came, became real life bars because of the bar in the movie. So it's, you know, it's great how they reflect each other and how kind of society works right there with cinema. But we really realize how much bars are part of our culture when we start kind of breaking it down and looking at these things. Some of the ones I found here, the show is probably not popular, the movie's not too popular, but I love some of the names. I think they're creative. I think they're excellent. And a good bar name is just awesome. You know, um, one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time, and I understand I didn't watch it till the 90s, it was made in the 40s, is Casablanca. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's an amazing movie. I think you do have to understand it is a period piece, you know, meaning the story really relates to the period they're in. And if you understand that kind of period at the beginning of World War II, in which the movie is made, you know, and what is going on in Europe at the time, it really relates to the to the plot of the movie and to the story of the movie. But the movie revolves around a bar, Rick's Cafe Americana. That's it. He's he owns a bar, he owns a nightclub, and that is where the majority of the movie takes place in the bar. Um, Victor Laszlo, who's kind of his rival and ends up leaving with his once was you know betrothed, um, comes in, orders a champagne cocktail. I, I love it. It's Put some sugar in the bottom of the glass, sugar cube, teaspoon of sugar or a sugar packet, hit it with a little bitters, top it off with sparkling wine. Really easy, champagne cocktail, really easy to make, old school, traditional drink. I think there's, there's a movie out there that I think is amazing that I don't think many people have seen because it's not very popular and extremely hard to find if you want to watch it online. I've only found it on YouTube, uh, dubbed into Dutch, I believe, to where I had to read the subtitles to get it in English. But I have seen the original movie. It is starring Mickey Rourke and is called Barfly. Now, Barfly follows the life of Steve Bukowski. And it, it tells stories of his real life for a 10-year period when he was unemployed and did nothing but hang out in bars in Los Angeles, California, where I am now. To play the part of Steve Bukowski, Mickey Rourke had to go drinking with him in these bars for a month to get the feel of the role and to become kind of Bukowski and where he was and where he was at at that time. Um, what's great about the movie is not only is, are the bar scenes set in some of the real dive bars that he, you know, frequented in the Los Angeles area. But a lot of the people that are sitting in there as the extras are the real customers that hang out in those bars and real bar flies that he knows and remembered him from that experience. And they decided why cast extras when you've got the real thing right there. And they used him in that movie. Great movie. It's about bars, has a great scene at the end to all my friends as he toasts. Watch the movie. It's a fantastic movie. You know, a couple other movies that are all about bars. Roadhouse. Roadhouse is all about a bar. It's all, uh, I think, at the very beginning, Patrick Swayze catches a bartender stealing and kicks a lot of people's butts and throws a lot of people out. Um, also, one of my favorite comedies, Harlem Nights. Uh, Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. And what do they do? They own a speakeasy. They own a saloon. And that is what the whole movie is based around, their rivalry with another speakeasy, another saloon order, owner and kind of gangster in you know, New York at that time. Uh, I have never seen this one, but I do believe it revolves around a bar, St. Elmo's Fire. I believe revolves around St. Elmo's Bar. I will admit I've never seen it, but it was mentioned so many times in articles and things that I was looking at at Google. I felt it just necessary to bring that up as well. You know, 
getting into some horror movies, The Shining, excellent horror movie starring Jack Nicholson. You know, him and his family are there to watch a, um, a you know, hotel up in the mountains during the wintertime when the hotel is closed. And the hotel has a certain history of horrible things happening there. And Jack Nicholson runs into not only the ghost of some of the people that have passed there, but also has long and extensive conversations with a ghost bartender. In in uh, wait, I've got it here. Uh, in the gold room of the Overlook Hotel. So that's a very big part and a very big turning point in the movie when you realize that he is start to lose it and he's having these conversations with someone that's not there. It's a fictional character that's just part of his imagination. Uh, on the funnier side, Shaun of the Dead, a British comedy. Uh, you know, they're fighting zombies and they make their last stand at the Winchester at their local pub. When all else fails, where do you go? You go to your local pub. Once again, an integral part of the movie. Um, I, I have a clockwork orange here and it, no one's seen that. It's kind of an old movie and it's a very strange and a very weird British movie. But there's a scene in Clockwork Orange where they go to what, what's labeled as the, the Corova milk bar. And what they're supposed to be drinking is some kind of spiked milk that has some kind of, we're guessing, hallucinogenic in it. Um, you know, they're sitting on chairs that are mannequins with their legs down. It, it's a very weird scene, but it's also a very weird movie. So um, know if you're going to watch, watch Clockwork Orange, it, you're, you're going to be thinking about it later. It, it's a very, very strange movie. But, you know, it happens in all genres. Action movies, I love Goodfellas. I think that's a great, you know, gangster type New York movie. Um, big scene where, you know, uh, Joe Pesci jumps up, Am I a Clown to You? Takes place in the, uh, uh, in the Bamboo Lounge, which is where they hang out at. Another thing they mention in there is they take their girls to the Copacabana, which is a real spot. So I, it, it's great how, you know, real names are used, real spots are, are put into movies. Um, you know, another one I can think of, which is kind of a cheesy Saturday Night Live comedy movie, is A Night at the Roxbury. Also a real, very famous nightclub here in Los Angeles. You know, they put these real places into it because it, it is such a part of our society. Um, Kill Bill. The last super huge fight scene happens in a bar in Japan. Uh, I believe it's called the House of Blue Leaves. Once again, showing that, you know, bars, bartenders, it, it crosses over cultures. Um, yes, there are cultures in this world that don't drink. Uh, Islamic nations, um, I don't believe Hindus as well, which is a large part of, you know, the population of the United States. But for the rest of us, you know, it's very acceptable, socially acceptable thing and, and very much a part of our societies. Uh, old movie, Indiana Jones, which I love. One of the best scenes is he gets in a huge fight scene at the Raven in Nepal with his old girlfriend. And uh, the Nazis catch him. The guy reaches for the medallion, burns it into his hand. Once again, the bar plays an integral part in that movie. Uh, if you've never seen Boondock Saints, really good, fun movie. And they're Irish. So, of course, there's going to be a bar. They spend a lot of time at McGinty's in there. Uh, Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger has a great bar scene at the Venusville Bar, uh, in which they show, you know, they show a woman there who is, let's say, augmented. Um, very cool scene. Also very young when I saw that. So a very memorable scene. Memorable scene. You know, a, another Tom Cruise one is Top Gun. He hits on the girl in Top Gun, you know, that he's making the play for uh, by singing her and um, uh, Everly Brothers song in the middle of the bar in this big show. That's where the turn is. That's where he meets, you know, the, the, the female heroine of, of the movie and kind of makes his play on her. Uh, if you've seen any James Bond movie, you've got to know he drinks a martini, shaken, not stirred. And he drinks what's called a Vesper martini. It is gin, vodka, and lalette, which is, um, you know, similar to vermouth and then it's a little bit of a fortified wine but they're taking white French wine and they're adding uh, citrus liqueurs to it, letting it steep for a little while in a wooden barrel, uh, giving it the flavor and giving it kind of a different flavor and making it into the Lillette, which is a little stronger, probably about 30% alcohol, something around that. So half ounce of Lillette, three ounces of gin, one ounce of vodka, shaken, not stirred, up in your martini glass, and you got the Vesper. Um, it was actually invented by Ian Fleming, who is the author of uh, the James Bond's books and first appeared in Casino Royale in that book. Now, if you watch any cowboy movie or any pirate movie, there's a good chance you're gonna see a bar or tavern. 
they're going to show up. They're going to be an integral part of it. Um, you know, even in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, when they go back in time, they meet Billy the Kid. Where do they end up? Where do they meet him? They meet him in a bar. They meet him in a saloon. You know, um, and, you know, it, it goes beyond our planet. Uh, what about Star Wars? One of the most integral scenes that sets up the plot in Star Wars is the meeting of Han Solo in Mos Eisley's Cantina, which, because I'm kind of a Star Wars nerd, I have found out is really called Chelman's. And the drink of choice there, the Tatooine Sunrise, which I thought was funny as I looked up weird stuff online. But that's where the meeting is. That's basically the catalytic moment in the movie that sets it off and gets the story going and gets the story moving, gets Luke off Tatooine and, you know, training to become a Jedi and realizing his fate. Um, you know, Harry Potter, they go to bars. You know, even in the fantasy world of wizards, uh, they have the three broomsticks. And I love this one, too. The Leaky Cauldron. What a great bar name for, you know, for that type of movie and that type of uh, uh, environment. Funny movies. Blues Brothers have a great bar scene in Bob's Country Bunker where they're playing behind, you know, a uh, chain link fence and people are throwing beer bottles at them and breaking on the chain link fence. Um, one of probably my favorite parts in the whole movie when they come in and introduce themselves to the owners at the beginning, they ask them what kind of music your people like, and they say both kinds, country and Western. Great scene, great movie. Uh, Police Academy. If you've seen any one of the Police Academy movies, because it is a running gag from movie to movie, they always reference an, uh, let's say, alternative lifestyle drinking establishment known as the Blue Oyster Bar. Um, you know, those movies came out when I was very young, too, and it was very much a joke uh, among myself and my friends to talk about the Blue Oyster Bar or say that some people went to the Blue Oyster Bar or stuff like that. And, you know, it, it even goes beyond that. It goes into cartoons. Um, who framed Roger Rabbit? You know, Jessica Rabbit. What did she do? She sang at a nightclub. That was her job. Uh, even in Beauty of the Beast, even a Disney movie. They have a bar there. They go out to the tavern there. So it, it really does cross all cultural burials and all genres and stuff like that. You know, when I started thinking about how kind of bars relate to television, and it's a little bit different because, you know, you go to see a movie once, you have a serial television show, it comes into your house once a week. And now it comes in your house all day because we just stream them. We don't have to wait the next week, you know, for us to see the next show. But you really become involved, involved in the characters' lives. You really feel like you are part of their group. And a lot of these shows I, you know, center around bars or definitely have bar scenes in them as part of the catalyst you know, to, to the plots and to what's going on in the show. Of course, got to mention Cheers. Um, once again, I was pretty small when Cheers started, and I loved it. I was already obsessed with bars when I was about 10 years old and could think about nothing else. I thought they were the greatest places in the world, and I still do to this day. I loved that show. It was my favorite show. And, you know, they managed to have a very long run uh, despite losing Shelley Long. They were able to replace her, Be, you know, despite um, the character of Coach dying, uh, I believe, when they were on hi hiatus between seasons. What did they do? They found a young actor named Woody Harrelson and they gave him his first break and they put him in there and they put him on television. So, you know, even there is even a very successful spinoff of that show, Frasier, um, you know, where they introduced Frasier Crane, who is the, you know, psychiatrist and a big part of that show as well. So, I mean, that show is all about bars. It revolves around bars. But then I started thinking about what other shows do, too. It's sunny in Philadelphia. That shows all about them owning an Irish pub in Philadelphia called Patty's. And most of the show takes place in that pub. That's where the conversations happen. That's where everything's going on. You know, another one is How I Met Your Mother. Very much of that show takes place in McLaren's bar. And that's where they're spending their time. That's where they're talking. That's where, um, you know, Neil Patrick Harris is picking up women and taking them home, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, another one, I'm surprised this one didn't come up more, but I remembered it. The Drew Carey Show. They were always in the Warsaw Tavern. And that's, you know, where most of the show was set, and where a lot of the show was set. Um, I'm surprised it didn't come up more because it had to be successful enough for him to land the Price is Right job and get out of doing his own show. I thought it was a funny show. I liked it. You know, I've been watching the show on Netflix called Peaky Blinders, which is about British gangs in the 1920s. And uh, once again, 
their their main holdup, you know, they're doing their business out of their bar called the Garrison. It is a major part of the plot, a major part of the show. Um, I have never watched The Sopranos, but I saw these names come up that are that are bars used to The Sopranos. One is the Crazy Horse, but this one I love, the Bada Bing. What a great name for an Italian gangster bar, the Bada Bing. Where are you going tonight? The Bada Bing. So I always just thought that was great. You know, um, Roseanne Barr had a television show in the 80s, I think into the early 90s for a long time. Um, I think people don't realize or they have forgotten that for a long run, it was the number one show on television. It was number one. Where did they go to drink? The Lobo Lounge. They went to drink. They went to shoot pool. There's tons of scenes that happen there. That's a part of the show. Oh, one of my favorite shows as a kid. And, it, you know, it's, it's a silly show. It was actually made because they canceled a show and they just needed like five or 10 episodes to fill a time slot till the end of the season. But the Dukes of Hazard gained so much popularity in that little half season run that they ended up making five seasons of it. And I loved it as a kid. I love the Dukes of Hazard. Where does, you know, um, <laughs> where does Daisy Duke work? She works at the bar nest, at the boar's nest. She works as a barmaid. Once again, integral part of the show. They're often at the boar's nest. It comes in all the time, you know, it, 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 and we can go, you know, back in time. MASH is set in, you know, 1950s uh, Korean War. But even though, you know, they are distilling their own liquor, making their own what got to be like light, white lightning type martinis, because if you're distilling it like that, we're talking about 90, 95 percent stuff as compared to, you know, what we drink. that's usually about 40 percent now. But they also had a bar they went to. Rosie's Bar, owned by a local Korean that they ran, that she ran, and they would come into all the time. Uh, you know, we could take it into space. Star Trek: The Next Generation. Even on their spaceship, they had a bar called Ten Forward, who was, you know, who and who was watching over Ten Forward? Whoopi Goldberg of all people. So, you know, still, even then, I, I think back to to one of the shows I loved as a kid at, at Three's Company. You know. Uh, Suzanne Summers, you know, Three's Company was, I liked the show. I think it was funny. It was stupid though. But it, it's it's a big deal because Suzanne Summers was the first like TV star to basically hold out for more money and end up leaving the show because they were not willing to pay her enough. And no one had ever done that before because everybody was so happy to be on television and be in Hollywood. And she said, if you're not going to pay me this, forget it. I'll leave. I can make money um, other ways. Um, you know, went on to plug the thigh master and hopefully she made just as much money doing that. Uh, I love a TV show called two and a half men with Charlie Sheen, uh, very much because I live, my roommate in Florida had, uh, very much some Charlie Sheen tendencies to him. So, uh, you know, us living together across the street from the beach, there, there were some striking similarities. It, it was like that show without a kid. Um, you know, they always talk about Pavlov's in that show. They show several scenes in there. They also refer to a bar called the Sand Dollar, which seems like something that would be Malibu and beachy and stuff like that. Uh, I only mentioned this one because I love the name. Um, there's a show called Mama's Family. It is a spinoff of a character in the Carol Burnett show that they were able to take and make into a series. I think it only lasted a couple seasons. But the bar they go to there, it's called The Bigger Jigger. Which I think is a fantastic name for a bar, and I had to throw it in there. You know, once again, we go back to the old West. There's Cowboys, really old, old Western show called Bonanza. They go to the Silver Dollar Saloon. The Golden Girls down retired in Florida would go to the Rusty Anchor, which I thought was a great name as well. You know, even going back to older shows. Um, when I Love Lucy went off the air, at the time, it was the longest running show in television history. It was the most popular, biggest, longest running show. And what did Ricky Ricardo do? He was a musician. He was a band leader at the Tropicana Club. All right. Once again, integral part of the show. That's where he was every night. He was at the club. He was out at a bar, you know, and then he would come home and Lucy, you got some explaining to do, Lucy. Awesome show. I loved it. You know, getting into cartoons. And I know a lot of these are cartoons are pretty uh, kind of adult themed cartoons stuff like the family guy they go to the drunken clam which i think is also a great name south park skeeter's bar um the simpsons also a hugely popular very long-running show what's a big part of that show moe's tavern 
There's even one episode that really centers all around the bar where Homer makes a drink, the flaming Homer, but then Moe steals it, makes it into the flaming Moe. And his bar, you know, gets huge popularity over this specialty drink that he's making, the flaming Moe. Integral part of the show. Um, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants. Even way down deep in Davy Jones' locker, they still got a bar down there called the Salty Spittoon, which I thought was very fun as well. And then even puppets. The Muppets even had a bar. They had Ralph's Tavern that they would go to and hang out in. So, you know, it really does cross over all kinds of boundaries, cultural lines, different genres, and things like that. But as I got more into it, I realized that, you know, that, that wasn't all. That wasn't, you know, all the ways that bars show up in entertainment. There are bars in comic books. Superheroes go to bars in comic books. The X-Men go to Harry's Hideaway. Um, in the Batman comics, the Pelican, the Pelican, uh, sorry, the Penguin, um, played by Danny DeVito in the movie with, uh, in the older movies, I should say, uh, he runs a bar called the Iceberg Lounge because, you know, penguins like ice. Um, you know, DC Comics has the Oblivion Bar. I believe in the Marvel, Uni Marvel Universe, the villains go to the bar with no name. Um, not a big comic book fan. I, I will admit that. Um, you know, uh, Tony Stark ha has a bar in his penthouse that is run by a cyber tender, as he calls it, that can make drinks that, uh, you know, no human ha has ever tasted before. Um, uh, the Transformers, the guys are robots. They still go to a bar up on Cybertron. Um, you know, Mac Adams old, old oil house is what it's called. And, you know, there's even a part of the Green Lantern comics where uh, one of one of the people in the Green Lantern, I'm sure I'm not sure their whole society is called, leaves to become the warrior and starts his own bar, which is like Planet Hollywood for superheroes, showing off superhero memorabilia and stuff like that. Uh, I guess it does get destroyed uh, at certain times in the comics and rebuilt. But then as I was looking in the comics, I found a Japanese comic. They called it manga, which I'm not exactly sure what sort of sect of Japanese type comics and stuff like that it is. But it is a whole comic book series about a bartender named Ryu Sasakura. And he is a genius protege bartender. And, um, you know, he gets trained uh, by his, you know, guru bartender and he opens his own bar and, and he works at the Eden Hall bar. And, you know, he listens to people's stories and kind of helps them through, uh, you know, their stresses by giving them the right cocktail. It says he serves the glass of God, which is a way of saying that he knows just the right cocktail to serve in any particular situation. So, you know, he helps the patrons get through what are some unusual situations and things that come up in life. Um, I like one of the comments that, that someone made about it, putting this in there, because I, I, I think it's awesome. And once again, it's a comic book, but it really does reflect real life and what's going on in real life. He wrote this. Um, Bartender insists the right drink at the right time is about starting an earnest conversation with oneself. To know which beverage is appropriate, the bartender must be a good observer. Ryu can deduce, deduce one's feelings by looking at their hands and knows if they're telling the truth or not. The stories of the customers sometimes parallel the history of the liquors he uses in the cocktails. Um, it's a crazy thing, but we have to do that. Sometimes you have to read people. You have to see where they are. You have to see, kind of look into them and look through them to know the appropriate cocktail to serve them at that proper time. And I really do feel like that's true. The right cocktail in the right situation at the proper time, you know, really does take you into some, you know, a sort of self-reflection and looking through yourself. So awesome comic book. I have started to kind of get them because I want to read them because I think it's a very cool premise. And once again, it shows how the bartender can, you know, cross cultural boundaries, how, you know, it, it's something that transcends culture, transcends race, you know, transcends everything that, that we look at to, to separate ourselves from each other. This is what we have in common. This is one of the things we can come together and, and be a part of. Still, I, I kept kind of digging. I kept going in what other types of entertainment have bars in them. Video games. And, you know, some of, some of the newer video games, um, you know, your Grand Theft Auto, 
you definitely got to go into bars. There are different bars you can go into. You can just shoot pool. You can pick up ladies. You can dance. You can do stuff like that. Um, World of Warcraft. Also, you got to go into pubs and taverns. That's an integral part of the game. That's where you get equipment. That's where you meet people and get information. You know, even into kind of the fantasy world, Final Fantasy, um, Legend of Zelda. One of the Legends of Zelda's, I like this name as well. One of the Legends of Zelda's has a bar called the Lumpy Pumpkin, which I thought was hilarious. So I decided to share that. Um, okay, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this one before. It was kind of an old game. And um, I found it very funny and disturbing when it was first showed to me. It's called Leisure Suit Larry. And what you do is live the life of a middle-aged man wearing a leisure suit in the 70s. So part of that is going to Lefty's Bar and picking up women, which is part of the game. Um, once again, it's just a reflection of society because that's a part of society. You know, and in those times, uh, you know, if you ever played gambling games, poker games, stuff like that, they've integrated a bar and uh, they, you know, put a bar in there or included a bar in the game or even in some poker games you can have a drink sitting by you at the table you can send another player drinks you know gambling and liquor go hand in hand it's it's very hard to have you know to have gambling where you're not serving liquor because um how else are you going to make bad decisions and lose all your money so i think it's kind of funny that you can just get mock cocktails fake digital cocktails on some games like that you know once again in the space universe if you play a star wars game there's going to be a canteen you know, that cantina scene is famous from the original one, and it shows up in all their games. If you're playing a pirate game, once again, anything with pirates or cowboys, you're probably going to see a tavern or saloon of some sort. Um, you know, Red Dead Revolver is, is a very cool game, very popular game. There you go to the Armadillo Saloon. Um, but, I, but I started thinking kind of more about it because when I was a child, and in 1983, they came out with a stand-up video game called Tapper. And you were the bartender and people came up to the bar and moved closer to you. And you had to slide beers down the bar before they got to you and hit them with a beer. Now, at some point, they changed the game to root beer. But in the original version, I'm pretty sure on the wall, on the back wall of the bar is a Budweiser banner. So I'm pretty sure it's really sponsored by Budweiser or they just threw Budweiser banner in there because of the you know popularity and the name recognition. But big surprise, one of my favorite games, arcade games as a kid, keep your Pac-Man, keep your Space Invaders, keep your Defender. I'll be over here on the tapper making people happy, shooting those beers down the bar to them. Um, you know, when I was kind of looking them up and I did not realize these existed. So this is what I also kind of discovered, uh, you know, while researching this and looking things up is that there are bartender action games out there right now. And I think that's kind of crazy um, because I am very much into real life bartending. I, I don't know that I would get into virtual bartending, but I, I think it goes, you know, just to say this, um, you know, it's a desirable job. There are people out there that wish they could do what we do and what you're training to do. You know, it, it, it you know, it takes a certain something. It, it takes a certain amount of just courage to jump into it and say, Hey, I want to go to school. I want to do this. You know, this is what I want to do. And I, I don't think a lot of people have that and they don't want to make that leap and they don't want to take that chance. So, you know, um, I, I'm going to take a quote from cocktail cause I watched it last night. One of the parts I like about it and, you know, um, he's being trained by Cohagen and, uh, Ah, he keeps, you know, telling Tom Cruise, who's Flanagan, Cohagen's Law, Cohagen's Law, which are all kind of cheesy. I never stuck to any of them because didn't think that much of any of them. But at one point, he says this line, and it really stuck me from last night. Bartenders are the aristocracy of the working class. And that is very much true. And if you kind of think about it that way and approach it that way and, you know, realize that it, it, it's amazing. It, it's amazing can't see it. I can't tell you how much I love this business. I can't tell you how much I have a passion for it, how much I was actually inside the bar right now that's not open so I could just be in a bar. Um, and, it, and it is really that. It Becoming a bartender took me from working three jobs to working one job. And that is a big change. You know, I made more money working one job than I did working three and had a lot more free time to enjoy it. It, it changed my life. It changed my lifestyle. 
And I think that that's a great quote and I, I couldn't have summarized it better. I couldn't have put it any better myself. So there's a video game called VA-11, H-A-L-L-A. So it spells Valhalla um, called Cyberpunk Bartender Action. You got to make drinks to the patrons, serve them and listen to their stories. But here's the thing. It's not a linear game. So you listen to the stories, you make the person a cocktail. And depending on the cocktail you make them, the plot line changes for the story and it goes in a different direction. So you directly affect the plot line by the cocktails you serve and that you make for the person, for the virtual guest, I should say, in the game. Um, I, I, found, I found a handful of just bartender simulators too. And once again, it struck me as odd because I do it in real life. Um, you know, that would be like, a race car driver playing a race car video game. It, you know, it, it would be the same thing in my eyes, but you know, I, I found a very cool one, Bartender Simulator, where, you know, you've got to buy your own bar, run it, make cocktails to attract people, fix it up, get nicer bar stools, make it look nicer until eventually you build it up into a very, you know, successful bar and very successful business. Uh, I saw another one like that called Bartender Hustle, which is cool. And I saw this one, uh-oh, bartender. And in this one, you don't just make the drinks. You have to solve puzzles to make the drinks and get the drinks out there and put them up. So I thought that was kind of cool, kind of a puzzle game. Hey, I got to make this drink. They give you a puzzle. You figure out the puzzle. You serve the drink. And, and uh, it, there's another one that, that actually has three versions of bartender, has three versions of it. Perfect mix, mix it up, and the celebs mix. And once again, you know, it's, it's a bartender simulation. Um, if you look at some of the videos on YouTube, it, it's pretty funny because it has you know, a real life look behind the bar. You go over, you click on your vodka bottle, it pours some vodka. You know, you click on your orange juice bottle, it pours some orange juice. There you are, you made your screwdriver. So I thought it was very cool. I thought it was very funny that they have these kind of games out there and that these games exist because I had no clue. I just been doing it in real life. I didn't know anyone had a desire to virtual bartend, but I, I guess it is a thing. So, you know, that right there. That's bartenders and entertainment, bars and entertainment, you know, how we affect society and the role we play in society it is directly, you know, directly reflected in our entertainment, in our media, in our cinema and things like that. So I'm going to make this into a two-parter because I knew that this was going to be too much for one whole lesson. So I have another part of this that I want to continue next Wednesday when I'm back home, I have my setup, I can do more of a demonstration. I would like to talk about some of the Hollywood hotspots. What are some of the famous places and famous hangouts that, you know, famous people hang out in this area, you know, throughout history and throughout the years? What are some of the famous bars here and special places? The other thing I want to talk about is what are some of the favorite drinks of celebrities? You know, what are they drinking? What do they order when they go out to a bar? Um, you know, I know a big trend now is make your own tequila, your own mezcal, or your own wine, which a lot of celebrities and, you know, entertainers as well as uh, musicians and uh, athletes. So I was going for an athletes do. That's a very popular trend right now. Um, but, you know, what do they drink? What do they like? I think that would be awesome. Also, we're going to learn how to make the Hollywood cocktail because there is a cocktail with that name. And fortunately, I'm not home, so I can't do the demonstration now. But next Wednesday, we will do a demonstration where we'll make a Hollywood cocktail. We'll talk about famous bars and we'll talk about what famous people and celebrities like to drink when they go out. What is their drink of choice? So thank you, everybody, very much for tuning in. I do appreciate it. I will see you 3 p.m. Pacific time next Wednesday. Until then, have a great week. Stay safe. Put smiles on faces and dollars in the pockets. Thank you, everyone.